Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Our worship team a hand clap. Amen. If you will turn with me tonight to 1 Samuel chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. And I know there are times, anybody that's been in ministry at any amount of time will tell you, there are times that the Lord almost puts you on repeat, you feel. Um, when God's trying to speak to His people, we find that in Scripture, when you found a word repeated twice, like we see in the New Testament, verily, verily, it meant it was important. And I think the same applies to the word tonight. It's not a, anything profound. It's simple. But yet, it's been repeated so many times, I think it's very important for us as believers to see to realize, to grasp hold of, and to remember. So I will forewarn you that the first half of this message is very sad. But I promise you that what God is doing in my life, what God is doing in this church, what God is doing in our country is not sad at all. I know the news, Sister Mary, would like to portray it as everything's going dark. And we know from Scripture that this world may get darker. But I know that Jesus is coming back for a glorified church. And where there's glory, there's power. Where there's power, there's light. And as this world gets darker, this church, the true church of the living God, shall continue to burn brighter. Amen. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 4, we're going to begin in the first verse. And the word of Samuel came to all of Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched besides Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array or put themselves into battle positions, into alignment against Israel and when they had joined the battle Israel was smitten before the Philistines and they slew many and they slew of the army in the field about 4000 men and when the people were come into the camp the elders of Israel said wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they may bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims and the two sons of Eli, Hophini and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all of Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. And the Philistines heard the noise of the shout and they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the covenant of the Lord or the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid. And they said, God has come into the camp. They said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of the mighty God, of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. We could stop right there and preach a great message. They shouted, The enemy seems to be afraid and confused. But it goes on. Someone in the Philistine camp begins to say in verse 9, 
Be strong and quiet yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews as they have been to you. Quiet yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter. For there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophini and Phinehas, were slain. Let us pray tonight. God, we come before you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for its anointing. We thank you that it's alive and it's well and it's still speaking to us. And God, I ask that we be sensitive to your word. Open our ears that we would hear. Open our hearts that we would receive what your word has for us tonight. And Lord, we love you and we praise you. And Lord, we ask that we apply this word to our lives so we can further your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, and the church says, Amen. Amen. So again, I tell you tonight that this portion of Scripture seems quite sad. The children of Israel have have brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, which was the physical representation of the presence of God into their camp, and they have lost it. But there's more to this. As we read on, we'll find that one of Eli's, one of Eli's sons, his, his daughter-in-law, one of his son's wife, his son's wife has, is with child and gives birth to a son and she names him Ichabod because she says the glory has departed from Israel. The glory has departed from Israel. Such a solemn story we read of here. But why? Why was there no victory? Why, why did this great calamity happen to the children of Israel? They're the children of Israel, right? They're the people of God. They are to serve the Lord, correct? These are people that shouted with a great shout. But yet, they still lost the battle. These are people that brought in the Ark of the Covenant, which was a precious item, symbolic of the presence of God, and they still lost the battle. Why was there no victory? Why did the glory depart from the children of Israel? promise you stay with me tonight. I I believe God wants to speak to us because the Bible tells us here in in, in, in 1 Samuel, in verse 3, when they lose the first battle because it tells us, the scriptures lay out to us, there's actually two battles. There's the first one that doesn't go well and then the second one which doesn't even come close to going well. But after the first battle, they didn't consult God. They didn't didn't consult a, a prophet or a man or woman of God. They consulted themselves and they said let's just go get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it here and maybe really what the scripture translates to mean is maybe we will have good luck and God will deliver us and having the Ark of the Covenant in the camp will deliver us so their first mistake was they did not consult God about the matter they acted in themselves and and they wanted the Ark of the Covenant present in their midst but in the middle of that phrase that we say the Ark of the Covenant it means there's a covenant A covenant is not just a one-way street, it is a two-way street. And we find that, and I'm going to show you through Scripture tonight, that the children of Israel at this time were a people that wanted the Ark of the Covenant present in their midst, uh, but yet they wanted to keep no covenant with God. The Bible tells us, if we go back to 1 Samuel chapter 2, the, the Bible literally says in verse 12 that Eli, the high priest, his sons that we read about that die in this battle, his sons Hophini and and Phinehas they are literally called the sons of Belial or the sons of the devil they were priests 
Yet God called them sons of the devil, and he goes as far as to say that they knew not the Lord. That's hard to take, but as you go on in 1 Samuel chapter 2, you'll find that they were messing with the sacrifices that were given unto God, and they were taking the best for themselves, and they were giving what was left over in the fatty parts unto God. And and God said that these young men, their sin was great before Him, and that it, it abhorred Him or blasphemed or provoked Him to anger. But that's not all. These young men were sleeping with women of the congregation of Israel, but yet still operating in the temple of God, trying to be holy men. They were literally sleeping with their congregants in the temple, in the church house of the Most High God. And Eli, the high priest, he he said a little something to them, but he took no great measure to stop them from operating in the temple. He never took, he never, he never gave them the, the 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 strong arm of discipline or correction. He never tried to restore them or or bring them to a revelation of what they were doing. He just let it continue to happen. And it got so bad that God became silent. How do we know this? The Bible tells us as we go into chapter 3 of 1 Samuel that the word of the Lord in verse 1 was precious in those days because there was no open vision. What does that mean? There was no revelation. There was no direction being given. The word of the Lord was few and far between in those days because sin and immorality had made it so so impossible for God to speak to His children. There was no prophecy being given. Nothing seemed to be happening. Because of the unrighteousness and immorality, God was rarely speaking to His people. So this tells me that before the battle was ever fought in our text tonight, before the camp of Israel ever shouted with a great shout, before the elders ever sent for the Ark of the Covenant to come into the camp, the presence and the glory of God had already departed from Israel. Again, a very bleak, bleak situation. You see, without His presence, without His glory, without His power, there is no victory. The Israelites had already lost the battle before it had even begun because of their immorality and their sin. And this is where my title comes in tonight. They had a shout, but they had no victory. They had a shout... But they had no victory. They shouted with a great shout. It, sh- it shook the earth. It, it rang the earth. The Philistines were, what's going on? What's happening? We've never seen or heard anything like this before. But yet when the battle came, they still lost. They still had no victory. Why? Because the glory and the presence and the power of God had departed. You say, what are you saying tonight, Pastor? I want to tell you and lay out to you tonight, I want to tell you about a a, a time past and a time present. A church past and a church present. I want to tell you what God has, what, what, what has been going on in our earth in the past few decades. But I also want you to know what God is doing presently. And, and, and I, I promise you, we're going to end on a good note tonight. But I, I remember in my lifetime, I, I'm, I'm not 
that young, but I, I remember, and many of you can remember exactly where you were on September 11th, 2001. It was as if time stood still on that morning. I can remember being a young boy and my mother, we were homeschooled, and, and many would say that's what's wrong with me, but I, I, I was homeschooled, and, and listen, there's nothing really wrong with me. My mother and father did an all right job, and, and, and I'm, I'm proud of what they did, and they took the time to deal with me, which was a feat in itself. If you knew me as a little child, just watch Ava sometimes, and that's kind of how I was, but like really bigger and, and much worse, okay? Um, so she's, she's really an angel compared to how I was, and so my parents put up with me, but I remember we had a schedule, you know, we had to get up, we had to make our bed, we had to be at the table, we had 15 minutes to eat breakfast, and then we had to jump into our first subject, and, and dad, taught, taught, uh, dad taught math and science, and mom taught history and English, and, and I remember my mother and father hardly ever turned on the TV, but the TV was on that day, and they stopped us from what we were doing, and I, m I remember my mother sitting me on the couch, and she said, you need to see this, most parents would have never let their, their, their seven year old see this she said you need to see this because this is a day that you will remember for the rest of your life and and I remember sister Sharon it's like time stood still the twin towers were attacked the pentagon was attacked there there was another plane down in a field that they believed was going to attack another place but had been overtaken by the passengers and and intentionally put down so no one else could have harm done to them. But I remember also that the church houses were full. People were afraid. People were confused. And it just seemed that our, our entire nation had been impacted to its very core, to its, its very soul. It seemed as if that, that everything was just dark. And people wanted to get a hold of some light. And again, the church attendance was unprecedented. But I believe that in the middle of what I believe was a wake-up call for the American people, and especially the American church, is God was showing us, listen, it could all be over tomorrow. We have to work Why it's yet day is what... The Gospels say. And it was this wake up call. But how quickly. The church fell back asleep. How quickly I, I saw it. I, the attendance would eventually go down. And, and I know that many of you in this house tonight. Uh, you, you can remember and you can think of in your own minds. People that you went to church with in 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. That they're still alive today. But they're not even close to being in the church house anymore. They were then. But they are not now. They were then, but they are not now. And through the years, there has been many good services, but it seems like there has been few lives changed. It, for the church, there has been many new buildings erected and new building projects, but it seems that there's been very few conversions and now the enemy has ramped up his attacks upon the people of God and we see that the church is attempting to operate with a shout and with goosebumps but without victory. We sing about victory. We sing about it tonight. And I, I, I want to get to that but I, we've sang about it for years how we've had the victory but I will tell you growing up in, in this millennia in the last two decades I can tell you of a time past not too far back uh, where that, that, that nobody lived in victory. We came in and, and we shouted. We had great youth camps. We had great conferences. Uh, we had great what we thought were moves of God. Uh, we, 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 we experienced some things and I'm not, I'm not trying to take away from those things. Those things are all good. Uh, but I want you to know that I, it's one thing uh, for you to shout in these altars but it's another thing uh, to have victory in your life. David could dance before the Lord with all his might, but yet 
be an adulterer and kill a man just a few mere years later. And we find that the children of Israel, again in this passage, they shout, they shouted with a great shout, but yet their priests that were bearing up the very presence of God, the very Ark of the Covenant, were the ones polluting the sacrifice. Uh, they were the ones that were, were, were taking away from God, that were sleeping and, and in full of sexual immorality, but yet they operated in the church house. I know that we have heard in the last few years prophesied that God, even from this platform, that God was exposing some things. And and I believe that God is. But I, I will tell you, Brother Larry, from talking with people, I think it is unprecedented that people didn't realize that God was going to expose the church. Many people thought, well, it's just going to be political leaders. I believe it still could be. But I don't know if you've seen the news lately. It only almost month monthly. This man of God, this woman of God, this man of God, this woman of God, and God is beginning to cast a light on the church. Just like he did with Phineas and Hophini. He said, listen, he, he, you, can't, you can't stand in this platform. You can't sing a song. You can't work in these altars and say, oh, I got the shout, but at home you have no victory. You can't say that, oh, I love the Lord. I serve the Lord. He said, Jesus said, listen, there's going to be those. There's going to be those in Matthew 15 that honor me with their lips and just talk over good about me oh I'm a Christian he says but their hearts are far from me Jesus said that there's going to be many in Matthew 7 that cry unto him Lord Lord let us enter in he says depart from me you worker of iniquity I never knew you that's a sad thing to say that's a sad thing to see Paul told Timothy that all these things he says this know also in in, in 2 Timothy 3 He says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, and despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God that have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such stay away you say what what does this have to do with anything what 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 does this have to do with anything we're going through church in the season that we're in as the body of Christ and in America We cannot have a shout, but not have victory. We cannot give God lip service and say, Oh, I worship in the house of the Lord on Sunday, but I live like hell Monday through Saturday. We cannot live in two worlds. We cannot, listen, the Bible, my Bible tells me, I don't know about you, but my Bible hasn't changed. My my Bible hasn't changed my entire life. I I could ask Pastor Ronnie if he was here tonight. Has the Bible changed since you've gotten older? Has God allowed certain things and not allowed certain things? Listen, I'll tell you, sin is sin. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 6 to come out from among the world and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And you say, what what does this have to do with anything? And this is where I want to get to tonight because I told you I was going to tell you about a time past, about a church past but I want to tell you about a church present and a time present because I began to see something in the last year and a half that has really changed my perspective on what God is doing in the day and the hour that we're living in because 
I begin to see something that has just begun to change the trajectory, shift the atmosphere of the church. There's been something happening, at least in these walls, in walls that I've been a part of. We were in church last week in Hillsboro. God's doing great things over there. God's doing great things in Lebanon, Ohio. God's doing great things in Germantown, Ohio. God's doing great things here in Connorsville, Indiana. And I began to realize that, that there was in the past, there was many people that it was just about numbers and it wasn't about conversions. It was just about how much we can get in the offering plate and not how much we can affect our community. It was about building bigger buildings and not about building the kingdom of God. But what I've realized is that there is a generation and you are that generation under the sound of my voice because you are present for such a time as this. There is a time that has come and what I've seen in the last year and a half is these young people, you adults, begin to stay up and begin to stand up and say, we're not living this way anymore. We're not having a shout on Sunday and having no victory Monday through Saturday. We're not getting filled up on Wednesday just so we can barely make it through Sunday and so we can get filled up again. What has happened is we have become tired with the status quo. We have become tired with the church wanting to live in the world. And we've decided that we want the world to be impacted by the church. The reason why I saw many tears shed Sunday and many people didn't even know what was happening. Let me tell you for those that don't know what that was. That was called conviction. In the God way, the people have changed conviction for the word. I'm offended. You say, Pastor, offended me Sunday. No, the Holy Spirit convicted you on Sunday because we can no longer operate in the realm that we have. We can no offer, we can no longer offer our, our, our selfless and selfish prayers that we've offered. We can no longer look internally. We can no longer look at ourselves all the time, but we have to begin to look out. Outwardly, because there's a generation that has seen there's there's people out there that have seen a church with a shout but no victory but I want you to know that in the day that we're living in there is a shout that is returning to the people of God and it has victory in it it has life sustaining power in it it has anointing in it it has the Holy Spirit of God flowing through it there's a power in it I want you to know tonight that there is a Joshua there is a Joshua beginning to lead beginning to lead the people of God into the promise you see they in our story tonight they were Israelites they were living in the promised land this was after Joshua's time they were living in the land promised of God but yet they wanted to act like those in the wilderness they wanted to be pagans like those in the wilderness but Joshua was raised and he raised up a generation through God and through God's guidance excuse me tonight he raised up a generation that was in the wilderness and longed to be in the promise not the other way around for too long our young people have been in the promises of God have lived in the presence of God and they desired what that world has out there but brother Chris I want you to know that the tables have turned and now the world out there in the wilderness is desiring the promise Promises of God. They're desiring the promises of God. We see in our text tonight that they shouted with a great shout. But because of sin and immorality, there was no victory. But all that's changing, all that's shifting in the present time that we live in. We're no longer waiting. I preached up. On Friday night in a youth service, I said, we're no longer waiting for God to move, but we are becoming the move of God. I'm telling you, I'm not going to sit around and wait for my turn. 
I'm not going to sit around and hope that God moves. I'm not going to sit around and hope that I get swept up into a move of God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to offer my life as a living sacrifice unto God. I'm going to allow him to transform my mind. I'm going to allow him to transform how I live my life. Why? Because I'm not waiting on a move of God, but I'm becoming one. So we see, if you will, turn with me real quick to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. I'm just going to read to you a few verses. Landon, I'm going to go with verse 15. I told you to start at 16, but if we can start at 15, I would appreciate that tonight. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day. And compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with trumpets. Joshua said unto the people, shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. Go to verse 20. So the people shouted, and when the priest blew, the, blew with the trumpets, uh, and it came to pass that the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted, what, with a great shout. And that wall fell down flat. Uh, so the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. You see in verse 20, they shouted with a great shout, And the walls fell down. We see in our text tonight that they shouted with a great shout and nothing happened. They still had no victory. But as we go into Joshua chapter 6, when they shouted, walls fell down. Strongholds came down. The enemy had to bow. The enemy had to be removed. The enemy was defeated. Victory was given to them. But why? It's 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 the same story, if you will, but the opposite. Where the children of Israel in our text tonight in 1 Samuel chapter 4 failed through sin, failed through immorality, failed through blaspheming God, defiling the house of God, playing with the world, but yet trying to operate in the church. The children of Israel, when they were going into the promised land, operated the complete opposite. The Bible tells us that Joshua gets alone with God in Joshua chapter 1, and God tells him this, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither thou be dismayed. For thy God, the Lord thy God is with thee wheresoever thou goest. He said, listen, I know you're going into a place that you've never known before. Excuse me tonight. You're going into a place uh, that you haven't been before. I want you to know, church, uh, that that what we're feeling, what we've been feeling in this house, uh, Brother TJ, is something that that is so real and genuine, and God is taking me to a place uh, in my personal prayer life uh, that I've never entered into before. God is taking me to a place in my walk with Him. Uh, Sister Sharon, where He's stretching me. Uh, He's just really pulling at my heart. Uh, He's really breaking me, uh, and He's He's remolding me. He's reconfiguring everything that I thought I knew. But he said, to, he's saying to this generation the same thing he's saying to Joshua. Be strong and of good courage. Why? Why? He said, because I am with you and I have commanded you to go forward. Church, I'm not going back to how it used to be. I refuse to go back to live in the spiritual life that I had a year ago, that I had two years ago. I, I am sick and tired of the church saying well I've come to this place and I'm okay with this life I'm okay with the prayer life I have I'm okay with the walk with the Lord that I have because it doesn't interrupt my schedule no I want something where God begins to take over me that his word is like fire shut up in my bones that I cannot contain what God is doing in my life and he's saying listen I go with you 
But the children of Israel, we see in Joshua chapter 6, they have, they have a shout and they have victory also because what they did in Joshua chapter 3. If you flip over to Joshua chapter 3, one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible, Joshua said unto the people in verse 5, Sanctify yourselves, cleanse yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. The reason why the children of Israel and Joshua had uh, in Joshua chapter 6 had victory and those in, in 1 Samuel chapter 4 didn't have victory it's because those in 1 Samuel chapter 4 lived in sin uh, but those in Joshua chapter 6 lived in purity and where there's purity there is power where there's a pursuit of holiness uh, there is righteousness and where there is righteousness uh, God says I'll come and I'll meet you our Bible says that the prayers of a righteous man prevaileth much availeth much it does much so where the children of Israel got the, the shout and the victory from is because they were sanctified they cleansed themselves they got themselves into alignment with what God was wanting to do the Bible goes on and says that, that when they, they crossed over the Jordan that they crossed over in verse 17 on dry ground you say what does that have to do with anything I want you to know this uh, that they lived in they grew up in the wilderness uh, and they grew their parents were disobedient uh, their parents were complainers uh, their parents could not inherit the promises of God uh, and they had to get through some things uh, they didn't go over the river the Bible says that God parted the waters and they went through the river you say why is that important to us today uh, because there are many in this house uh, that have been dealing with generational curses on your life you think that I deal and struggle with this because my mommy and daddy struggled with this. I'm dealing with this anxiety because my mother deals with this anxiety. I have this fear because my, my father had this fear. I refuse to operate in what God's called me to do because my mother and my father didn't operate in what God's calling me to do. But God said when they sanctified themselves, I got them to a place that their mother's and their fathers uh, could never go. I got them through. I got them over the Jordan. Their parents never crossed over into the promise. Uh, but they did. Why? Because they had sanctified and cleansed themselves. But that wasn't it. God wasn't done. That wasn't the only reason why their shout was a shout of victory. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 5 that the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made, sharp, made him sharp knives and he circumcised the children of Israel at the heel of the foreskins. And, and, and this is what it says in verse 4. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt that were males even all the men of war died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt now all the people that came out were circumcised but those but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, they came forth out of Egypt, and them they had not circumcised. The Bible says in verse 6, and stay with me here, the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness to all the people and all the men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. It sounds like our text, our main text tonight. They didn't obey the voice of the Lord, so they had no victory. They didn't obey the voice of the Lord so they had no promise they didn't obey the voice of the Lord so they had no purpose they disobeyed the voice of the Lord so God said I can't use you and the Bible tells us uh, unto, uh, sorry, let me catch myself here. I'm getting all excited. Because they obey not the voice of the Lord unto whom the Lord swear that he would not show them the land uh, which the Lord swear unto their fathers uh, and that he giveth us uh, a land that floweth with milk and honey. But catch this in verse 7, and their children whom he raised up in their stead. He raised them up uh, despite of what their parents had done, uh, despite of 
of who their parents were, he raised them up. uh, And them Joshua circumcised. uh, For they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them. By the way, the Bible would go on to tell us in this chapter that when he circumcised them. And when I talk about circumcision, I'm not talking about in the flesh. Because the Bible talks of a circumcision of the heart. Uh, The Bible talks about when God, the Holy under the unction of the Holy Spirit begins to remove things out of our life. Uh, You say, well, I'm sanctified. They were sanctified. Uh, They were in a process of cleansing themselves in chapter 3. But in chapter 5, God said, if you really want to go where I'm taking you, if you really want to see the experience, the shout and the victory, there's some things I'm going to have to remove out of your life. Uh, Listen to this, young people. You know know I'm a big believer in this and this is nothing new. uh, But there's some music that you're going to have to hand over to God. There's some friends that you're going to have to hand over to the Lord. There's some relationships that you're just going to have to hand over to God. There's some there's some movies and some television shows that you like to watch that you're going to have to hand over to God. There's some things on your phone that your mama and daddy don't know about that you're going to have to hand over to God. There's some fears and anxieties that nobody else knows about that you're going to have to hand over to God. There's some depression that you're dealing with that you're trying to hide from your family. You're going to have to hand them over to God. Why? Because if you want to experience victory, if you want to experience the shout, you're going to have to let God have surgery in your life. I'm almost done. I'm I'm wearing myself out. But the Bible tells us that when this was done, that God rolled away the the reproach He rolled away the sin. The sin of Egypt. The sin of the wilderness. See, what is that important tonight if you stand with me tonight? Landon, if you don't care to play something softly. God rolled away the reproach. See, okay, that's great. But I want, uh, why this is so powerful to me is because, Gloria, this is where I feel that the church in America is. Because I've seen, I'm going to come down to you all, it's going to get dangerous. I've seen my own eyes in the last year and a half. Especially the last year and a half. I've, I've seen snippets here and there, but the last year and a half, Brother Larry. I, I get to work with you young people. And the fun part is they get to work with me too. See, people say, oh, well, you're keeping the young people straight. No, the young people are keeping me straight. I'm the crazy one. Okay. But all kidding aside, I've had, I've had the privilege to work with your young people and, and you know what I, I've seen in the last year and a half? Carly, I've seen you get through some things. Lexi, I've seen you get through some things. TJ, I've seen you get through some things. Emma, I've seen you get through some things. And you, you, Gary, you didn't even realize because all you saw was the obstacle. I'm going back to Joshua 3. All they saw was the obstacle. But, all, but what they knew is, is what you knew, what, what all of you young people knew is there was a promise. I've heard Pastor Ronnie, I've heard him preach about it. I've heard my parents talk about it. I, I've heard Pastor Jade speak of it. I, I've heard ministers grace this platform and, 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 and preach about it, preach, preach about that there's something more. And he these young people, I, I can speak. I, I, I know God has brought many of you through a lot of things, but I, I, I've seen this up close. God has brought you through some things. And you didn't even realize that he was, he was taking you closer to him. He was drawing you into the promise. And, and you didn't even realize it. You just stayed faithful. You just, I know I want it. I know I want it. And you battled. 
when you didn't feel like it. You worshiped when you didn't feel like it. You, you, you've come to these altars and you've cried out to God. And I've heard their prayers. God, I, I know there's more. I want more. Simple as they may be, they're super profound. They've allowed God to stretch them. and They've been mad at me for allowing God to stretch them. But I think it's fun. I think it's fun to watch you squirm every now and again. But this, this, is, this is where I'm getting to. When they allowed God in Joshua chapter 5, he was, he, he was leading them. He was the vessel that God was using. They allowed him to circumcise them. And again, I'm talking deeper here, circumcision of the heart. When you allowed God in your, and many of you are still allowing but I, I believe many of you have just really been transparent before God and you've opened up your heart to him he said if it's not of you take it in Joshua 5 he says and it rolled away the reproach rolled away the yesterdays it rolled away that past church because there's been repentance there's been supplication there's been prayer there's been an earnest desire to see the glory of God and God's saying that's all I've ever wanted children of Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 4 they shouted but they didn't have the victory because they would not allow God to have what was rightly his and the children of Israel in Joshua chapter 6 saw walls fall because they opened their lives to God and they said, I'm yours. And the past church that we've had to deal with for the last two decades, God said, I'm rolling away the reproach. God rolled away the, the reproach, but guess what? Chapter 6, there was an adversary. We say, oh man, he rolled away the reproach. Awesome. But there was an adversary. But young people, adults tonight, there may be adversaries. But they didn't get out of chapter 5 without divine direction. Angel of the Lord, the captain of the Lord's army, appeared unto Joshua and said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to shout. And you're going to see victory. And I'm not talking about dancing a jig. If that's what you feel like God wants you to do. I'm all for that. But a shout is, is an expression. It's authoritative. It's powerful. That word shout. Is the, is, is the Hebrew word ruah. Which means a shout of victory. A shout of joy. A shout of rejoicing over the enemy. And the Lord has just been dealing with me so much about authority. And young people, elders alike, we're in a time that yes, it may seem dark, but we're in a time where I believe we're going to see the lost come in like never before. They're going to be drawn in by the grace of God. You're going to begin to lead people. And, and you're going to begin to lead people you never thought you would lead. You're going to be able to minister to people you never thought you would be able to minister. God's going to open doors that you've never seen before. Why? Because he's saying, I'm rolling away the reproach. Because you're in pursuit of holiness. You're in pursuit of righteousness. You're in pursuit of a relationship with me, not religion. You're in pursuit of all that I am. You're seeking my face. So, so I told you if you seek me with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your, that you, I, I promised you that you would find me. 
And the reason why we have services like we had Sunday and the reason we're experiencing God, you know, on Friday night preaching in Hillsboro, there was a young girl filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She was just overjoyed. We had someone filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit here. Uh, me and Pastor met with two young people, teenagers, in this house on Sunday night. And they said, listen, we're called to missions. We want, we want to reach the nations. We want to do what God is calling us to do. I don't know about you, but I feel like God's rolling away some things uh, and He's bringing some freshness. Uh, he's bringing some boldness. Uh, he's bringing some authority. He's bringing a shout of victory back to the church. Amen. And I want to be a part of it. If you will, take the hand of the person next to you. If you don't have a person next to you, find somebody. Find somebody. Please, please find somebody. There's power when we pray together. Or two or three. We're two or three. We're going to find people to pray with. Amen. And again, I, I, the Lord has just dealt with me. I'm praying with authority. What's authority? Praying. When, when you have authority, you know when the command is given, it's being done. And it's not that I'm controlling God, but it's that God has given me the keys. Whatever I bind, He binds. Whatever I lose, He looses. That's not arrogance. That's operating in confidence. And what that means is heaven is backing you up. That's what praying in authority is. It's calling those things that are not as though they were. I'm not talking about naming and claiming. I'm talking about having faith to see the will of God done in your life and people uh, around you's lives. So we're going to pray. We're going to pray, and I want you to be as sincere, as humble, as, as we approach uh, the throne room of God as you can be tonight. But I want you to be confident. And I want you to pray on the person, uh, for the person on your right and on your left. And I want you to pray confidently and with authority over their life. So here we go. We're going to pray. God, we come before you. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done in our lives. But God, I thank you more for what you're going to do. And God, I pray for my brothers and my sisters that are before me tonight. And God, I, I thank you for them. But God, I pray with, a faith, with faith, with authority, with boldness in my heart, with boldness in my spirit tonight. God, I, I speak peace over them. I speak peace over them. God, there's, there's a storm that may be raging in their lives. God, I speak peace over them. I speak joy unspeakable over them. God, I, I ask, Lord, that right now you bind every hindering spirit in the name of Jesus that would come against their life. God, I believe that you're still in the supernatural business. I believe that you're still able to heal. I believe that you're still able to deliver. I I believe, God, that you can still move. Lord, I believe, Lord, that you're doing something in our midst tonight. That you're bringing back a shout. You're bringing back an authority to your church. And God, when we shout, the enemy is not going to prevail. But the enemy will be defeated. Will be pushed back in the name of Jesus. God, I believe tonight, Lord, that as we're praying for one another that chains and strongholds are being broken I speak to that depression in the name of Jesus and I say be gone I speak to that anxiety in the name of Jesus and I say be gone I speak to that infirmity that they're dealing with in their body and I say be gone I speak healing over their lives in the name of Jesus God whether it be spiritual whether it be mental whether it be physical God I I ask that you do it in the name of Jesus. Uh, Lord, I believe that we're going to see Connorsville changed. Uh, I believe we're going to see Fayette County schools uh, changed in the name of Jesus. Uh, I believe, Lord, that Indiana will be changed by the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I believe, Lord, uh, regardless of what the news outlets say, uh, I believe that there's something happening uh, on the inside of America, and it's called the church. And they're in prayer. They're 
prayer and supplication unto you. And God, you're turning things around. Right now, you're turning things around. Lord, these young people, they, they have situations, God, but you're turning it around. You're turning it around. They, have met, they may have went through a, a living hell this week, but God, you're turning it around. The gates of hell shall not prevail against your church, God. Lord, the shout of victory is coming back. The prayer of faith is coming back. These young people are not going to pray just to pray, but they're going to pray to communicate with an almighty Savior. And God, they're going to pray with confidence and boldness in the name of Jesus. Lord, I refuse. I refuse to stay where I am. Lord, I will not become stagnant in my walk with you. But as pastor spoken from this house, uh, I believe, Lord, that we're going to press on and we're going to bloom. Oh, Holy Spirit, fall. Holy Spirit, have your way. Oh, Jesus, 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 do it now. Lord, you know the need. You know the need, God. You know the need, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, yes, even though when they offered themselves unto God, there was an obstacle. Jericho was right there. But they had faith. Hebrews 11 tells us that they had faith. And Lord God, I ask that you give this generation, I ask that you give every person in this house faith, God. That they will speak unto the mountain and say, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and it'll be done. God is bigger than the obstacle. God is bigger than the diabetes. God is bigger than the back pain. God is bigger. I'm going to have faith. I'm going to have faith. I'm going to have faith. When nobody else has faith, I'm going to have faith. When everybody else believes that cancer will kill you, I believe that God will heal you. When everybody else believes that, 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 that there may be a death sentence diagnosed over their life, God, I believe that God can still move. Oh, I believe our best days are ahead of us, not behind us. Jesus, these young people have just begun to see what you have for them, Jesus. Lord, change us. Change us, challenge us. Let your word convict us, God. To be offended by you, Lord, is not a bad thing. But, Lord, you're bringing correction to our lives. Lord, let us walk in purity. Because when we begin to walk in purity, we begin to walk in power. When we begin to, watch, to walk in righteousness, God, you'll lead us the right way. And, God, when we begin to be holy as you are holy, God... Your glory and your presence will begin to be manifested in new ways. And God, I believe that we're just at the beginning of what you want to do. But give us the strength to press on. Give us the strength. Give us the zeal, the passion to complete the work that you've laid before us. Lord, as we leave this place tonight, let us leave not only with a shout but a shout of victory. Not just with a shout, but a shout of victory, but a shout of power, but a shout of authority. In the matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Can you give the Lord a shout of praise, a, a hand clap of praise tonight? 
Hallelujah, I feel the presence of the Lord in this house. But church, let us walk in it. Jesus at the pool of Bethesda, he said, walk in it. Walk in it. Walk in the healing. Walk in the liberty that you found. I love each and every one of you tonight. Be safe as you go home this evening. But I ask that you come back prepared spiritually for Sunday morning. Because I believe that God is just tearing down strongholds. And he's making ways where there seems to be no way. And, and I ask that you come prayed up and ready to experience the presence of God. And I pray that you have a great week. In the name of Jesus, we hey love everybody, you. Pastor Ron, I pray that today's message and program has been just a great blessing to you. And I just uh, am so thankful that we had the privilege to come into your home today or wherever you may be watching. I would encourage you to uh, continue to follow us. We're on all of the major social media platforms. Uh, we have podcasts that you can follow us with. I would encourage you to reach out to us and let us know. Our information's on the screen. And uh, if we've been a blessing to you, please contact us. Let us know. And we look forward to sharing the word of the Lord with you again uh, next time. God bless you. We'll see you soon.